to want to know. What is the intellectual provenance? Is there anything to this thing, empathy? Or is it just, so to speak, another kumbaya moment, right? Is, is it mysticism? And the word goes out, we need a token graduate student to do research in the intellectual provenance of the distinction, the concept empathy. And Tulman, Professor Tulman says to me, Lou, how about it? So I say, I'm in with both feet. Right? And it's a dissertation. It's an interesting, engaging topic. I mean, usually, many dissertations are how many distinctions can I get to dance on the head of a pin. And there's nothing wrong with them. That's like, you know, great work and important work. And here I've got some, so that gets me, you know, that, I write a dissertation in the philosophy department, empathy and interpretation. At that time, mirror neurons, which weren't invented until even 1995, don't, nobody has a clue. I'm, I make, does it even exist? You know how philosophers are very skeptical about everything, and there's nothing wrong with that. And I, you know, I'm trying to prove that it exists. I'm marshalling examples, uh, uh, contagious laughter, um, and, and, and the like, to prove that there is this thing, a communicability of ethic. And so the work gets going. I teach for a few years. I'm like a starving scholar with four part-time jobs. I get an insurance company to train me in computing because I have it in my 28-year-old brain that I would have more success with women if I had more money. <laughs> and there is some truth to that, you know, though not in the way that my 28-year-old, I was single at the time, uh, not in the way my 28-year-old brain uh, imagined. And so fast forward, I have a career in business and computing, and in roughly 2008, IBM eliminates my job. And I say, hooray! And I write those three books on empathy since 2010. Empathy in the Context of Philosophy, A Rumor of Empathy. And uh, the project is to expand empathy in the community, to make empathy present. And part of that, we're going to actually define our terms, say what the heck we're talking about. So that's how this work got started. Second point I would like to consider is, it does actually happen to be Bastille Day. It is Quatorze Juillet, I mean July 14th, 2016. We'll put that on the tape as well, just as a timestamp. And, you know, at first I thought that was just a lucky accident, because Bastille Day is a good party, it's the French Independence Day, but there actually is a connection. And this is it. And when people, all kinds of people, human beings, when people don't get the empathy they feel they deserve, when people don't get the respect they feel they deserve, when people don't get the dignity they feel they deserve, people get enraged. Narcissistic slights. This was Kohut's work. I mentioned Kohut. He puts empathy on the map. Lou, is there any intellectual providence? I opened this book, right, The Analysis of the Self, and it's like dealing with narcissistic rage. All, I mean, it's abroad in the land. Now, it's not the only variable, ladies and gentlemen. Make no mistake. I mean, there's a lot of things going on. And I'm strictly speaking, talking only, assuming that everybody is not armed. You know, we're not, we're not, uh, we're not armed. But nevertheless, the Bastille Day event was one of a, a day of rage, in effect. You know, without going into all of the details, the storming of the Bastille, this old prison in Paris, the revolution, the French Revolution was just getting going. The king was empowering various of the demographic groups to have a say in the governance of the country. It's complicated, we're not going to go there. Nevertheless, narcissistic rage, wherever there is empathy, beware. Heads up. Take care. Can rage be far behind? Why? Because my empathy, your empathy, is imperfect. It's going to, I mean, we're, we're going to give ourselves permission to be human beings, right? And at some point, the empathy is going to break down. At some point, in spite of my good intentions, in spite of my commitments, in spite of my training and experience and our, our relationship or lack thereof, there's going to be a failure. And hopefully it's rather more of a manageable than, rather than a traumatic failure. But the, so that's the connection. Now, the, the, the challenging thing is what to do about it. How does one, you know, once again, how does one get the other person to calm down? A lot of people come into 
whatever it is they're coming into, including, I think probably less so when they sign up for classes, but a lot of people come into psychotherapy, a lot of people come in to see lawyers, a lot of people come in to see government organizations that are going to provide them with some service or other, and they're already angry. They're already, I mean, I mean to, be, to be straight, they're already just waiting. And it doesn't mean that they express that. It doesn't mean it gets expressed. It just means that they're simmering. And, you know, it makes one thing. So that's what it has to do with Bastille Day. Now, we're not actually going to do a drill down on the French Revolution. Uh, the commitment is to look at the secret underground history of empathy. And um, so we're going to define our terms up front. And, um, what, and so then I'll say a little bit more about the secret underground history. And I, the definition is on the handout. So you have it on the handout. And um, we're going to define our terms. And so this, I claim, I mean, I assert that this definition is an original synthesis of existing ideas. There's not a lot that's like totally, completely original in this definition. But it, if you look at each of the four parts, which we're going to look at briefly, and then follow them through aspects of the history of philosophy, David Hume, Immanuel Kant, no one would think of that Kant is a empathy scholar. It's not, it's, that's not intuitive. Uh, nevertheless, uh, and, and if we can't, we're going to get to Lips and Freud and some of the phenomenologists. Uh, um, and so, so here's a definition. And I, I want to say up front, this is not necessarily the truth with a capital T, uh, but consider the possibility. I argue for this, and I believe in it, I assert it, okay? Um, and I allow for the possibility that reasonable people may disagree. So the, basically, here's what I get in being empathic. I'm open to the other person. Openness to the other person. I call this receptivity. That's borrowed from Immanuel Kant. He's got receptivity and understanding. But uh, that was the result of my PhD dissertation right there. So, okay. Yeah. The rest of it is, is, is additional. So, I'm open to the other person in so far as the other it provides me with animate expressions of life. Not only expressions of emotion, but it, it's sensations thoughts. We're human beings. We've got language. It's highly linguistically wrappered, but not only language, right? I mean, it's not only language. There is a whole conversation about body language, which is abroad in the land, and which we're going to wrap up in here. And this is where the, the top bubble under empathic receptivity, so there are going to be four aspects of empathy. Empathic receptivity, empathic understanding, empathic interpretation, and empathic responsiveness, or speech, if you will. Uh, and I'm going to say a little bit about, and then about each of them, and then we're going to like drill down into how these show up in the philosophy of David Hume, in Kant, and in a couple of other thinkers, if we can get to it. Thank you, I corrected me. Now I noticed that the fine uh, lady there in white. <laughs> She's so fine. You've been waiting. Yes, I was just wondering in your research if And so the question is, what's the correlation between empathy and intuition? And it's a, you know, so here the short answer is, um, intuition is a good guess. Intuit often, oftentimes intuition is an inference based on clues. So define your, our terms, right? I'm going to define our terms. But you may have a different definition. So one definition that has been proposed is that intuition is making an inference based on clues, whereas empathy is having a vicarious experience of the other's experience. That's the assignment. But Fred. There's a, there's a couple questions. Yeah, I'm going to do the first one real quick and respond to yours. Was Sherlock Holmes empathetic? You know, I'm a big fan. I mean, as a, as, yeah, as a young man, I read Conan Doyle, so I'm playing, you know, and then I saw the very, some of the TV series. Well, he would, I mean, in the one representation, he's practically autistic. He's on the spectrum, right? 
I mean, and he's a brilliant, you know, he's a brilliant in, intu, intuitive person. So that would be no, you know. Yeah. He's able to see the clues, yeah. but not necessarily feel or think as but the other. Know, but there, I, are the, there is that cognitive element yeah. that he works his way through that, you know, the fact that, that you haven't shaved very well and you walked out means that somewhat your wife may not be looking at you that closely anymore because she let you go out. Yeah, yeah. There's a story in Holmes that way and, and you know, your shirt collar is there so your marriage is... And, and he's thinking that through very clearly yes. using some of the, the observable clues. My second okay. question that comes in there is looking and fixating on that about the learnability of that. Yeah. Has anybody seen the, the, the Netflix series Lie to Me? Excellent series. Very interesting because it, it, what it is is a scientifically trained individual looking at the muscles on the face yeah. to see whether the muscles like there is actually uh, representing what the inner feeling are. And, and so it's a, he's like a forensic psychologist or something like that who's examining witnesses or examining suspects, what they say and their facial clues of those 30 odd muscles. Yes, yes. Is that what you're, you're meaning? Yes. I, I mean, I think the short end, yes. trained to be empathetic. Yeah, I mean, that's some of that. I think that, that's the top down. I mean, that's what Paul Ekman is doing, right? right. And, and, and so I'm going to check out that show. I mean, it's not. But I do Ekman extensively. Yeah. Uh, but it just, it, one of the things about the show is it really creeps my wife out. It's <laughs> creepy. She can't do that anymore because yeah. then she can't feel she's fully empathetic with someone else because she gets the clues to distinguish, and, and it's a little obscure, well, but the guy on the left is yeah. a false smile, the one on the right is correct. Is That's a true smile. Yeah. Right? Well, that's a rather, right. the true uh, smile's on the right, yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, Here's the thing I would say to keep in mind for, in relation to empathy. We don't really know what's going on. Is he lying or is she lying because he feels guilty? because he really did it, because he's innocent and is afraid of being falsely accused. Many people who are innocent and have survived something, something difficult, are afraid of falsely being accused, so they're stressed. They give the stress sign. So Ekman is very clear on that, I want to emphasize that. Doesn't, you know that some, there's some deception, something doesn't line up, but to find out you have to talk to the person. There's no other way to find out. And so that moves beyond intuition or the sort of scientific reading of the yeah. case to the openness to empathy. That's yeah, what thank you. I mean, that's, I think that's, that's very, very nice. Very In nice. the vocabulary of lie to me, the micro-expressions always give them away. We find out if they're guilty or not based on the micro expressions. Well, that's right. That's the it's micro. A, it's a yes or no. In the well, that's the delicacy of empathy, right? I mean, that's the the, the 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 rust in the taste of the sherry or the, the taste of leather. It's the, the micro everything. There's the money, you know, it's like there's a growth industry now, actually, you know, and I hope I'm contributing here. Uh, and so, you know, so I want to, at this moment, I, you know, to acknowledge we're actually five minutes I'll past the 7.30. Now, I, we have not drunk all the wine yet, <laughs> and I'm not committed to staying until we do. I may have another glass. I have plenty of time. I know, you know, I defer to you, Fred, in terms of the logistics, because I've never been here, but I'm going to stay a little longer. You, but you all have permission to do what you need to do. I mean, the, the session is officially thank you. complete. And I thank you profusely. One of the things we're doing with this sort of conversation series is to introduce uh, and see. Uh, I've never seen you teach before. Yeah. I uh, and to sort of test this. Is there interest? Uh, is there ability? Is that and looking tonight at not only the philosophical but also the scientific understanding combined. I think uh, we need to have a course this fall in empathy. Uh, so look ahead. Uh, if, uh, I think that's what you're doing. Yeah, so, this was his audition. Let's yeah. say. Uh, and, and I think he passed the audition. Well, I'm so, honored. So, I'm so uh, happy. Uh, I'm happy. Look forward to, to the continuing conversation. We have a little more time. Yeah. We have the room. But but uh, uh, so feel free. Lou yeah, let's, I mean I wish to. Yeah, I mean thank you, Fred, and thank you one and all. I got a lot of friends here. It's so heartwarming to see you all. I mean, and you're one of them. And, you know, you might have a lot of hogs. You know, we can. Yeah, we'll get yeah, I can't hear you. Get it for your whole. And he may want to turn off his. Uh,